Hi, everybody. Okay, so Dr. Frank B. Wilderson III is a professor in the Drama and African American Studies, UC Irvine. He received his BA in Government and Philosophy from Dartmouth College, his Master's in Fine Arts from Columbia University, and his PhD in Rhetoric and Film Studies from the University of California, Berkeley. His work explores cinema's formal and narrative awareness of political ontology by bringing two unique modes of representation into conversation with one another. The cinema of red, white, and black directors and three traditions of epistemological reflection, humanism, feminism, Marxism, psychoanalysis, analysis, indigenism, um, meditations on sovereignty and genocide and social death. Mediations on the accumulation of fun fungibility of black bodies. He is also the director of the cultural and theory PhD program. His critical work is self-described as Afro-pessimist. Rather than celebrate blackness as a cultural identity, Afro-pessimism theorizes it as a position of accumulation and fungibility, that is, as condition of ontological death. One of the guiding questions of Dr. Wilderson's engagement with Afro-pessimism asks how the political stakes of analysis and aesthetics raised and altered if we theorize the structural relation between blacks and humanity as an antagonism as opposed to a conflict. Professor Wilderson spent five and a half years in South Africa, where he was one of two Americans to have held elected office in the African National Congress during the apartheid era. He also worked as a psychological warfare secret propaganda and covert operations career for the ANC's armed wing in Kunto Esize. His books include Incognito, A Memoir of Exile and Apartheid, and Red, White, and Black, Cinema and the Structure of U.S. Antagonisms. In addition to being an activist and a scholar, Dr. Wilderson is also a creative writer. And through his creative writing, he has received a National Endowment for the Arts Literature Fellowship the Maya Angelou Award for Best Fiction, portraying the black experience in America, the Zora Neale Huston Richard Wright Legacy Award, the Eisner Prize for Creative Achievement of the Highest Order, the Judith Stronach Award for Poetry, and the American Book Award. This evening, we are honored to have him here discussing the crisis of anti-black violence within the context of anti-blackness as it pertains to a more grand and permanent paradigm of social death imposed on black people globally. Let's give a warm welcome to Dr. Wilderson. Thank you. thank you, and thank you to all the students who, um, I was going to name them, but they've been named by Phyllis, so I just ditto that, and, and, to, and to Nico, who came in uh, with Maria, I uh, drove all the way to Irvine. I was very, very grateful for that. He and Marie drove all the way and, and uh, picked me up. So thank you very, very much. Um, this is, this is uh, you know, when I was leaving South Africa uh, in uh, 1996, I was, we were, not we, all of us, many of us were very demoralized. Uh, there had been purges in the ANC, uh, and the uh, moderate wing had actually, um, gained the kind of hegemony inside the party that it did not have in 1989 when I first arrived. And uh, we moved from the, there were a lot, there's a place called Shell House in, uh, in downtown Johannesburg where there were a lot of policy papers about what, was, what is the future going to look like. And we all assumed at that particular moment, 89 through about 93, so I, I marked the, the assassination of Chris Haney and the and the the, the marginalization of, of Winnie Mandela as as a major uh, sea change inside the party, um, and so um, I won't tell you my particular story because for twenty seven dollars you can buy the book, and uh, <laughs> but uh, uh, I was I was about to leave and I was walking through Soweto with a, a, a comrade, an organizer from the labor union called Kosatu, and I said you know. Uh, I don't feel my contribution has been worthy, and we are all really demoralized by the neoliberal turn that the ANC has taken. I'm going into academia, for, you know, I, that's what I, that's where I get my money, you know, but what can I do, you know? 
And he said, what we need is a theory. You know, we, we need, we need y'all in the academy to, to work on the exp explanatory power from a revolutionary perspective. And um, sometimes he said that analysis is going to be too big for us to figure out what to do about it in terms of mobilizing, but that's okay because we'll clear the space and, 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 and the more that we clear the space and the more thinking that you can do on, on these campuses, it'll work in a kind of synergy. So that's what I hope to contribute to um, and until the, the next moment comes along where we set it off, right? Okay, all right, let me begin with a provocation. Anti-blackness is a prerequisite for world making at every scale of abstraction. What do I mean by that? How is it that the anti-black anti violence is the DNA of civil society? To understand this, we have to think of violence as a structure or as a regime. For many of us, this is counterintuitive because we've been taught to think of violence solely in terms of acts and, and performances. But the regime of violence that um, subjugates African descent people, I would argue, is different even than the regime of violence which attends Native American genocide. Notice I said not the performance, but the, the, the structure. There's gonna be overlaps in the performance, and we can talk about that in the Q&A. The Native American was and is genocided for her land. There are pre-logical elements to the murder of 18 million people, to be sure. But land, land acquisition and the usurpation and usurpation of land give the genocide a kind of coherence, a kind of reasonableness, similar to the massacre of workers who have gone on strike, workers who have withdrawn their consent. You can't make an analogy between the violence Indians and workers are subject, subjected to and the violence which attends to black people. The regime of violence that subjugates the post-colonial subject cannot be an analogized, even though there are crossover points, cannot be analogized as a structure or reconciled with the, with the regime of violence that subjugates black people. The difference between the violence that elaborates and positions the black and the violence that responds to the transgressions of degraded non-black humanity can be understood when the unattainable denouement of black death is compared to the intrinsic denouement of Native American death. When in other words, what, what uh, UC Santa Cruz Professor David Marriott calls the deathliness of social death is compared to the life-affirming denouement that mobilizes something even as horrific as subaltern genocide. To illustrate what I mean, I offer an excerpt from Simon Ortiz's poem, Sand Creek, uh, followed by uh, a poem that I wrote called Law Abiding. Now, uh, juxtaposing these two poems will help to clarify how the regime of violence that, satur that saturates blacks is structurally incompatible with the regime of, of violence where contingency, this is an important word, we can talk about that in the, in the break if you'd like, where contingency as opposed to saturation is the operative modality, and how only one regime of violence comes with touchstones of cohesion necessary for redemption. And for those of you who don't know, uh, the Sand Creek Massacre uh, occurred uh, during the so-called American Indian Wars, uh, and it, it happened on November 29th, 1964, when 675 men from uh, the Colorado U.S. Volunteer Cavalry attacked and destroyed a village of Cheyenne and Arapaho in the Southeastern uh, Territory of Colorado, where they killed between 70 and 163 uh, Native Americans. Two thirds of them were uh, women and children. So let's begin with, uh, with Sand Creek. There should be moments of true terror that would make men think and that would cause women to grab hold of children, loving them and saving them for the generations who would enjoy the rain. Who are these farmers? Who are these welders? Who are these scientists? Who are those soldiers with cold flashing brilliance and knives who struck aside the sacred dawn and was not ashamed before the natural sun and dew? Artistically, they splattered blood along their mad progress. They claimed the earth and stole hearts and tongues from buffalo and men, the skilled butchers, aerospace engineers, 
physicists they became. The future should hold them secret, hidden, and profound. Okay, let's look at law abiding now. Excuse me. This is um, written <coughs> uh, after the occasion of Oscar Grant's murder up in um, the, the Bart, Bart Street, uh, Fruitville Station on the Bart up in Oakland. Don't slant the story to fit your needs. Bullets been catching hell from niggas long as I've been born. Life apple, apples, okay, you got your few bad bullets, but most work hard and vote. Yes, they vote and got wives and sweet kids in the clip. Who cradles them when the nigger vamps? Who says what to them? Mrs. Bullet, I have some bad news. Then what? It's about your husband, Mr. John Frederick Bullet. Or may I call you Frida? Frida? John Frederick passed this evening. Now free to be strong, for unsavory are the details. He died in a nigger's spine. Crushed on impact, now free to don't cry. The DA's on it, the judge has been briefed, and your husband's friends are in the streets. At first blush, an exegesis might be seduced into emphasizing what the poems have in common. The ravages of structural violence on two oppressed populations of color. But another look reveals that the two poems are actually symptomatic of the fact that the violence against Native Americans is not analogous to the violence by which blacks are elaborated in position. The violence of social death, that violence which elaborates and reproduces the slave, is fundamentally different from the violence which usurps Native American land and attempts to destroy the Indian's cultural and territorial sovereignty. The imaginative labor of these two poems is symptomatic of this difference. In the first section of Sand Creek, the poem establishes a filial integrity of the people who are being of the people who are being massacred. Uh, between the people who are being massacred, uh, sorry, excuse, a filial integrity of the people who are being mass massacred, uh, men who think and women who grab hold of children, loving them and saving them for the generations to enjoy the rain. So what we have here is an intuition on the part of Ortiz that even though the people being killed are seen as a, a degraded form of humanity, their humanity is fundamentally acknowledged. And in addition, there is a symbiosis, a kind of cruel interdependence between the genocided victims, the opening in the opening part of the poem, and the descendants of those committing the genocide, skilled butchers, aerospace engineers, and physicists. In other words, the relational status of both the Indian victims and the white oppressors is established. A reciprocal dynamic is acknowledged between degraded humanity, Indians, and exalted humanity, white settlers, with humanity being the operative word between both of them. This, this reciprocal dynamic is based on the fact that even though one group is massacring the other, both exist within the same paradigm of recognition and incorporation. Their relation is based on a mutual recognition of sovereignty. At every scale of, abstra of abstraction, the sovereignty is manifest at the, the body, family, community, cosmology, and physical terrain. At every scale of abstraction, American Indian sovereignty is recognized and incorporated into the consciousness of both Indians and the settlers who destroyed them. The poem's coherence is sustained by St structural capacity for reciprocity between the genociders and the genocided. This structural reciprocity gives the poem a vision of hope amid the violence, manifested in a sense of spatial presence, images of land and water, and in Simon Ortiz's sense that for both groups a future is possible. This means the violence the Indians suffer has a utility. The utility is the confiscation and occupation of land. And that utility makes the violence legible and coherent. A law abiding, on the other hand, is predicated on the absence of reciprocity, the absence of utility, and the absence of contingency, all the things that Simon Ortiz's poem takes for granted, absence of humanity. In fact, the poem suggests that a family of murdering inanimate bullets could have its grief and loss processed as grief and loss more readily than a family of a black murder victim. Law-abiding, in, in Jared Sexton, my colleague at, at, at UC uh, 
Irvine has written this article, and one of the, one of the, uh, one, on Katrina, one of the things that he says is that there's more carrying energy going to the dogs swimming through the, through the, the, the swamp than to the people standing up waving, waving to be rescued, okay? Um, so this is a kind of hyperbolic take on, on what he's saying, manifesting this carrying er energy in the bullet. Um, Law-abiding does not assume that the touchstones of cohesion, which make filiation, filiation being the structural capacity to have family relations, it, it, is not, it does not assume that the touchstones of cohesion, which make filiation legible, will or can be extended to blacks. There is in this poem no mutual futurity into which blacks and others will find themselves. The future belongs to the bullet. Filiation belongs to the bullet. Our carrying energies will be reserved not for the black who's murdered, but for the bullet. Reciprocity is not a constituent element of the struggle between beings who are socially dead and those who are socially alive. That is the struggle between blacks and the world. We need to comprehend the profound and irreconcilable difference between white supremacy, which is the colonial utility of the Sand Creek Massacre, and anti-blackness, which is the human race's necessity for violence against black people. The antagonism between the post-colonial subject and the settler, the Sand Creek Massacre or the Palestinian Nakba, cannot and should not be analogized with the structure of violence of social death. That is the violence of slavery, which did not end in 1865 for the simple reason that slavery did not end in 1865. Slavery is a relational dynamic, a relational dynamic, not an event and certainly not a place in space like the South, just as colonialism is a relational dynamic. And that relational dynamic in the colonialism, for example, can continue to exist once the settler has left the territory and ceded power. I mean, there's no such thing as an African country that um, has its own currency that is not tied to the currency of the so-called mother country, okay? But the settlers are gone. Afro-pessimism, uh, so th these, relations are, these relations are secured by radically different structures of violence. Afro-pessimism offers an analytic lens that labors as a corrective to humanism. It provides a theoretical apparatus which allows black people to not have to be burdened by the ruse of analogy. Because analogy mystifies rather than clarifies black suffering. Analogy mystifies black people's relationship to other people of color. Afro-pessimism labors to throw this mystification into relief without fear of the fault lines and fissures that emerge in the process. There is a compulsive and repetitive failure in the poem titled Law Abiding. As though in writing the poem, I unconsciously realized the futility of asserting something beyond blackness that is prior to the devastation that defines it. This is from, David Mer uh, from Ju Ronald Judy. And the force of the repetition compulsion with which the poem, within which the poem roils is, uh, is, is vertiginous. The DA's on it, the judge has been briefed, and your husband friends are in the streets. The poem contains no lines no fragments which can be cobbled together with enough muscle to check this devastation, to act on it in a contrapuntal way. This is not a case of the compulsion to repeat, which Freud describes in Beyond the Pleasure, Pleasure Principle, whereby the repetition is something that seems more elementary, more instinctual than the Pleasure Principle, which overrides it. Law abiding contains no political strategy or therapeutic agency through which the violence which engulfs black flesh can be separated from the poem's compulsion to repeat that violence. In a normal situation, that is to say, if Law Abiding was a poem about human trauma and genocide, therapeutic and or political intervention could be made in the case of therapy to help the poet become aware of a distinction between the violence he may indeed encounter from the state and a range of psychic alternatives to letting that violence consume his unconscious. And this is, for those of you who listen to the podcast, this is one of the things that um, uh, Dr. Haight and I talk about from time to time. I mean, he's a psychologist, and one of the things that, that, that he understands, it doesn't mean he gives up his practice, right? But he also understands what, what Fanon ran up against in, in black skin, white, white mass, is that the, the cure is okay as long as the analyst on, the patient doesn't leave the room. 
once you get out of the room, then there's no such thing in the Lacanian uh, discourse of contemporaries. Because what myself and Sexton and Marriott and other people, uh, and, and I think Fanon had argued, you know, ex Fanon argued accidentally because he went in there thinking, I'm going to find a cure. Uh, what he found was that the psychic health of the world actually depended, depended upon uh, positioning blackness as the foil against which humanity is made. So now, what does that mean for his patient, who will always be a foil for everyone else's psychic health? So, um, so um, in a normal situation, okay, a therapeutic or political intervention could be made in the case of therapy to help the poet become aware of a distinction between the violence he may indeed encounter from the state and a range of psych psychic alternatives to letting the violence consume his unconscious. In the case of politics, the vision elaborated by a movement could help the poet imagine a new day, okay, and thus imbue, imbue state violence with a temporal finitude, an ending point, even if I don't live to see it, right? As in the, the slogan, our day will come by the IRA, and so it did. Or the dream of Native Americans returned of Turtle Island, a restoration of, of their sovereignty. Um, even if the poet didn't live, live to experience that finitude, but recourse to political and therapeutic resources presume a potential for separating schemes of unconscious compulsion, that is to say the poem's repetitive compulsion, from the violence whose incursions are being compulsively repeated. This presumption only works for human subjects, subjects whose relationship to violence is contingent upon their transgressions. The slave's relationship to violence is not contingent, which is the, the, the problem I know many people in this audience might know is of raising a black child, right? What, what is the behavior? Where is the place where you can go? What will save you from police brutality? Well, there's nothing, actually, because this is a, this is a violence which is whimsical and not based on your performance. It's based on a, 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 the, the, the psychic need to, re, to repeat it, and this is what we're caught up in, okay? Um, so the slave's relation to violence is not contingent, we argue. It is gratuitous. It bleeds out beyond the grasp of narration, beyond the symbolic to the real, where therapy and politics have no purchase. Neither filial conflict to be resolved, for example, through therapy, or affilial conflict to be resolved through politics and insurgent resistance has purchase in a struggle for black redemption. The lines, Mrs. Bullock, I have some bad news, it's about your husband, Mr. John Frederick Bullet, or may I call you Frida? In these lines, the poem seems to realize that even the integrity of gender is more properly the possession of an in inanimate bullet than of a sentient black being. The violence against black people we are witnessing on YouTube videos, Instagrams, and the news is gendered as violence against black men in the main. But there's a problem here, and it's twofold. And I want us to think about this, even though I don't have a solution to you know, what, we, what we, we can talk about what to do, but I'm, I'm offering us an, an analysis. The problem is twofold. We lose sight of the fact that black women, children, and LGBT people are losing their breath, breath through the technologies of social death as well by concentrating so much on uh, hetero, heteronormative black men. Albeit, these people are dying in less mediatized ways. We also get drawn into responding to the phobic anxieties of whites and non-black civil society, which is to say the phobic anxiety of the threat of the black man. And as such, we offer sustenance to the juggernaut, even as we try to dismantle it. We enhance the pleasurable circulation of the modern lynching photograph, which is what these videos are. The cover of Time Magazine, for example, uh, with Walter Scott being shot in the back. As, as he runs, or the videos of Sandra Bryan just before her, her death. And so, you know, these videos are, are absolutely necessary, but at the same time, they, 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 they labor on two, two levels. One, as evidence in court, but as two, as a kind of, of grounding wire for people to say, ah, at least I'm not black, right? Um, so, um, and since these images are almost always of black men, they shape our agenda in profoundly gendered ways. But there's something even more problematic here at the level of structure. 
And that is, we come to think of the oppression as being es essentially gendered, as, as, opposed to being, as opposed to it being gendered in important ways. And this, I believe, gives us a false sense of agency, a sense that we can redress the violence of social death in ways that are analogous to the tactics of our so-called allies of color. We want the violence against us to have gendered integrity in the way that it does when it is leveled against the subaltern. Because it is though, we think it is as though by cataloging horrific acts of violence in a manner which could be properly gendered, one which relegates castration and police assassination to black men, which is the problem, the thinking problem of, 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 of law abiding, I admit that, and rape to black women, we think that our political discourse can offer us the protection of a sanctuary that we otherwise might not have. Now by sanctuary, okay, I of course do not mean sanctuary against actual rapes, sanctuary against actual castration or, or murder, but I mean the sanctuary of gendered recognition and, and incorporation, which in plotment in a normal political discourse, a normal poem like Ortiz's would provide. The narrative arc of such a sanctuary would look like this. It would move from equilibrium to disequilibrium to, to, the to the dream or the possibility of restoration re restored, which is equilibrium, which is to say the event of gender, gendered integrity, is being violated in a way that is, that is, um, that is gendered by rape, or ca rape, rape for, for women, castration, and murder for black men would be the moment of disequilibrium. And this turn of events, we, we would think, is the essence of agency through which equilibrium could be restored. But there are structural, there are structural injunctions against the narrative arc of sanctuary. There's a structural injunction against the dream of black sanctuary. Here I would probably say something about an Afro-pessimist orientation to the idea of gender and go into a very, I, I wrote a, a, an article um, in uh, feminist performance, I can I can send you the, the, the link, and it's a it's a it's a analysis of the the uh, structure of of thinking from the black feminist Sadia Hartman in comparison to the structure of thinking from the uh, uh, very radical uh, Italian feminist Leopoldina Fortunati, and I won't go into all that that here. It's it's the kind of thing that doesn't communicate well being read. I mean, yeah, being spoken, but so you, you, should, you could read it. But let me give you an anecdote, let me uh, wind down with, a, with an anecdote that kind of points to the um, theoretical analysis in, in that article. There's a cable TV series, uh, which I'm sure you, many of you are aware of, called Homeland. Um, and, you know, I'm just, I'm embarrassed beyond embarrassed to say that I watched this show. <laughs> you know, I mean, yeah. I'm all about fuck the police and I'm watching a, a show about the CIA, you know, <laughs> you know, over and over again, you know, <laughs> so, you know, but there it is, <laughs> a, a televised co recorded confession, you know, <laughs> okay. uh, all right, okay, so, <laughs> so, um, so Homeland, is about the trials and tribulations of a, of a mentally ill bipolar CIA officer named Carrie Matheson. In one episode, uh, her cover is that of an her cover is that of an investigative journalist who convinces the nephew of an Afghan Taliban leader that she can get him out of Islamabad and help him find safe haven in England. She convinces, I think the title of that is called About a Boy, if you're interested in that, uh, that episode. She convinces him that the two of them uh, must stay holed up in a secret apartment for three days uh, as a transport is being arranged for his safe passage to England. It's all a lie, right? She's really using him as a bait to lure his uncle into a trap that she might assassinate his uncle. His uncle is a, is a Taliban leader. And so in point of fact, the apartment is a CIA safe house in which Carrie Matheson holds this young man captive, even though he thinks they're in a love nest. She's, she proceeds to seduce him, uh, and so he thinks that they are in the throes of some sort of love affair, which is overdetermined by mutual consent, because that's what love is all about, mutual consent. Rape is about the absence of consent, right? Okay. In other words, he doesn't know it, but he is being raped. He's being raped repeatedly. 
Uh, this is, that is, his consent to this sex has been abrogated by the very structure of the conditions in which the sex takes place. It is a rape scenario because the sex that he mistakes for mutual attraction is really a series of multiple acts of aggression in which his consent has been eviscerated completely. The gun the white woman holds to his head needn't be in her hand. In fact, the gun she holds to his head is not one weapon, but the weapons of three million soldiers in uniform in their arsenal of drones and technologies of death. She forces sex upon him through her capacity, the capacity that her white skin embodies. Another way of saying this is to say that white desire is always already weaponized. She forces sex on him through the capacity that white bodies have to weaponize white desire. The young Afghan man is fucked. <laughs> he is fucked at every level of abstraction. The guns are in the, the, guns are in the bedroom. She, has a, she keeps a pistol hidden by the, by the, by the bed. The guns are also pointed at his head, his head from outside on the street, the CIA operatives who are watching the house. The guns are held at his head from high above in that the 9,000 drones that saturate the sky and track him as he makes his way back to Carrie's genuine objective, his uncle, whom she hopes to murder at long range through a, through a drone strike. We have here a pristine example in which white femininity and white masculinity occupy the same structural position vis-a-vis -a, -vis a man or a woman of color. To paraphrase Frantz Fanon in Black Skin, White Mass, the white family is a cutout of the state. Professor Jarrett Sexton at UC Irvine puts a finer, a finer point on this. In so doing, he's careful, but he's careful, and this is a point I want to conclude on, he's careful not to include the young Afghan man who is being raped by a white woman, as I have, but to hone in on the specificity of the black. He writes, quote, long quote, he said, it seems counterintuitive, but because of her historical implication in the structures of white supremacy, marked by her limited capacity to marshal state violence or state-sanctioned paramilitary violence, the white woman can have the black man raped, or a black woman uh, brutalized and raped for transgressions real or imagined. However, and because of this relation of power, Sexton goes on, she can also rape him, thereby reversing the polarity of a rape fantasy, pervasive in an anti-black world. Regardless of his strength and size, his prowess and his pride, he is structurally vulnerable to her. Sexton goes on, contrary to many legal, stan legal standard, standard legal definitions, she is, also, she is able to rape him without his necessarily being physically penetrated against his will. In this sense, the fear of rape, Sexton writes, and the fear of penetration must be carefully distinguished, separated. Sexton says, perhaps rape is better understood not as an isolated act, but as, a, but as part of a spectrum of sexual coercion generated within a broader set of social, political, and economic relations regulated, but not simply controlled, by the racial state and enabling permutations of enactment, end quote. And so um, we can now see how the geopolitical agendas of the white nation cannot be disentangled from the sex life of white femininity and white masculinity. In other words, white sexuality is always already weaponized. To put it differently, but no less to the point, the United States of America is a big, bad rapist. A big, bad rapist that projects the fantasy of its, of its own, of its vulnerability onto Muslims, Mexicans, Native Americans, and black. Fanon discusses the rape fantasy of white women in great detail in Black Skin, White Mass, and I won't rehearse it here. For our purposes, we should note that the rapist projects the fantasy of vulnerability by suggesting that she or he is the victim of, in this case, Islamic jihadism on the TV show, or the victim of black agitation against cop killing. Uh, the cops killing blacks, right? The, the big bad rapist would have us believe that America is the victim. And underneath that phantasmagoric projection, underneath this fantasy of vulnerability 
is a set of assumptions that America is indeed an ethical, social, and political formation. That the problems that America has are not structural, but rather that they are performative, to be found in acts of discrimination, or in the case of the use of excess levels of force. None of this would be a problem if not for the fact that the structure of violence, which, if not for the structure of violence that subtends this fantasy, the institutional violence that gives these fantasies what David Marriott calls their objective value. Professor Jarrett Sexton gives a concrete example of David Marriott's phrase objective value when he says, you better understand white people's fantasies because tomorrow there'll be legislation. That's what the law is. The law is the white fantasy as objective value. The white family and the white state have the firepower and the institutional, institutional infrastructure to enforce their projections. What, the, what people of color get to do when they go to the polls is decide which flavor of this rape fantasy they are going to support. In the words of George Jackson, quote, an electoral choice of 10 different fascists is like, cho like choosing which way one wishes to die. Voting then becomes an important performance of dispossession for people of color who are not black. But for black people, voting is not just a performance of dispossession. We have to dig deeper to see how the very bedrock of the structure, structure the very paradigm of electoral politics, is predicated on the sexualized violence against black people. Sexualized violence against black people is, elect, is, is electoral politics condition of possibility. Anti-black violence is the genome of electoral politics. In short, anti-black violence is the generic material of this organism called the United States of America. The fantasy projections that have been weaponized to rape the young African man would not be possible if the paradigm of, weapons, of, of weaponization was not already in place prior to the conflict between Muslims and the US. And that weaponized paradigm is overdetermined by anti-blackness. The US government could not become a democracy for people of color who are not black. It is not likely, um, but it could be possible. But if it ever rid, if, but if, if it, if it ever rid itself of the central ingredient which overdetermines its condition of possibility. That is, if we was to say if the United States of America were to somehow not be anti-black, then we would no longer have a country. It would cease to exist. So I've explained how the USA is an anti-black polity by using a synchronic analysis. I'm going to close with um, an episode, uh, uh, an anecdote from a historical point. There's a recent book uh, by uh, Ned and Constance Sublett called The Slave Coast, A History of the Slave Breeding uh, Industry. And what they have come up with uh, in this book, it's, it's elsewhere, but it's really poignantly researched and, and explained here, is that the Electoral College is a prime example of a so-called democratic institution that owes its condition of possibility to the sexualized violence against black people. Without the sexualized violence against and mass incarceration of hundreds of thousands of black captives, Americans could not be able to elect a US president. Thomas Jefferson would never have become president. In the late 18th century, early 19th century, there were 389,000 black people, African slaves, 389,000, who were bred like horses or sheep. This is a quote from Ned and, 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 and Constance Sublet. So in about less than a, two generations, 389,000 blacks were bred like horses and sheep into 4 million enslaved African Americans. The forced mating of slaves gave slave states more voting power based on the number of slaves they held captive. This is why South Carolina is a poor state economically compared to, to, to Virginia, because um, Virginia was the largest slave breeding state, and as a result, it gained 25% of the 46 electoral college votes, more than enough to put Je uh, Jefferson in the White House. So let's stop and think for a moment. Slave breeding is a form of captivity that dwarfs the kind of captivity that Muslims are subjected to in Guantanamo, 
and it dwarfs the kind of captivity of the love nests where the female CIA agent raped the young Afghan man. How else can 389,000 people be made, forced to procreate, under pain of torture or death, into 4 million people if they're not incarcerated and forced into sex? Slave reading is a kind of forced sex that makes, the words like, what makes words like rape and incarceration too puny and inadequate to explain. The Afghan young man, the Afghan young man had a prior moment of freedom and a prior space of consent before the white woman held him captive and raped him. For blacks, there is no prior space and no prior time of freedom and consent. The freedom of all others in the form of electoral politics owes its condition of possibility to the unfreedom, the lack of consent, and the sexualized violence against blacks as a people, not on an individual basis, but mass sexual violence. People of color experience this madness from time to time, but the forced procreation of blackness is the bedrock of this madness. The young Afghans' rights were violated by the white woman, but the concept of rights that can be violated or respected rises out of the breeding of blacks like cattle. That's the foil against which consent can be thought. You can't speak of prisoners' rights. You can, sorry, you can speak of prisoners' rights, but you can't speak of slave rights. The term slave rights is an oxymoron. Slave men were forced to impregnate slave women, and slave women, writes Harriet Jacobs in incidents in the life of a slave girl, were, quote, raised in an atmosphere of licentiousness and fear. The sublets go on. To own a slave was to have license to libertine behavior because sexual violation was intrinsic to slavery. Sexual use was part of the portfolio of privileges. Slave women and men had no consent to be violated. In other words, they were incarcerated everywhere and always because having no consent, they were captive to the violent and sexual winds of anyone, anywhere. All of this points to a paradigm of oppression, but not one in which blacks were subjects who found themselves in a context of captivity which denied them most of their rights, but one in which they were objects beyond the boundaries of any kind of rights discussion. A historical analysis of the Electoral College, as the sublets have done, illustrates how black people are political currency, not political subjects. Currency, not subjects. And that is the paradigm of our black people's existence today. Black people are political currency or objects, not political actors or subjects. Subjects have homes and at least the capacity of some sort of sanctuary, but objects exist as implements in the psychic life of subjects. Finally, if we look closely, we see that for the slave, there is no surplus value to be restored to the time of labor. There are no treaties between blacks and humans in Washington, D.C. waiting to be ratified. And unlike the settler in the Native American political imagination, there is no place like Europe to which slaves can return human beings. Thank you. So what is she not saying? She, she, she's not saying, um, you know, I don't, I don't experience life as a woman. I don't feel as a woman. I don't think as a woman. She's not saying that. She, in other words, so the, the book is uh, a structural analysis in, in, the, in the main. She's using case studies to make uh, an argument about um, violence and, and what is not available um, to black women in 
in terms of redress. And, so, and why is that? And I should say this, that there's a way in which Afro-pessimism kind of, when, when we see the work of critical theory, there, there are three registers in which it's operating. One is it, uh, it's in the social sciences, it's typically it's uh, an analysis of pre-conscious interests, which is to say an analysis of what happens in the world when people make statements about themselves. I am uh, black, I am hetero, I am gay, uh, I come from this uh, cultural formation, okay? And that is one of basically three registers of, of, of subjectivity. Another register of subjectivity would be unconscious identification. And so that is what's, what is motivating uh, desire, fixation, aggressivity, and you're not necessarily in touch with, um, you're not conscious of your unconscious desire and motiva motivation, but they're as much a part of your psyche as what you say, okay? And so people in the humanities might uh, linger or tilt their arguments through an analysis of, of unconscious identification. People in social sciences might tilt their arguments through an analysis of pre-conscious interests. Um, why do people say they vote this way or that kind of thing? But then there's a third register of subjectivity, and that is a structural position. And that's the, the, the liability, or the, the, maybe the problem of some of my, my work in terms of understanding is that I'm heavily weighted in thinking structural position. You know? And that is the paradigm <coughs> that exceeds and anticipates you. In other words, for example, when you're born and the doctor does uh, an ultrasound, when you're about to be born, and it's determined through your, your sexual organs, you're a boy or a girl, then the world be, the world starts to build, weave a web around you. Your parents go home and just do a pink. I mean, I mean, you know, just surface level there. But in other words, so you, you come out position. And structural position, an analysis of structural position for me is really important because. Um, it's where people were thinking up until the end of the 70s. I and mean, I think that the, the, the crushing, Kohn-Tampo, and the crushing of the Black Panthers, and, and the crushing of the movement made, had ripple effects into the academy, so that now people aren't really, theoreticians aren't doing the work on structural position that we should be doing. There's so much hope in the work that it doesn't actually theorize as much as it should that aspects of you that you don't determine. You're placed on the chessboard without your, and part of the reason is that because a structural position, to make a position, man is a position, woman is a position, they, they, these things don't exist. They're, they're formations of a paradigm. And paradigms come into existence through oceans of violence. It takes an ocean of violence to move from feudalism to capitalism. It takes an ocean of violence to, to shift to another paradigm. And uh, violence is just not a topic in, in, in vogue anymore. And we're hopefully bringing, bringing it back. It's, so what Hartman is doing is she's not thinking gender at the level of performance. She's saying that kind of thinking is not bad, but what it's done is it's not allowed us to think about gender as a structural position. And that's what I mean by, by, by gender integrity. And so this, the, the, I, it's a very good and complicated book. And the other, and her mentor is a woman named Cortez Spillers, who uh, wrote an article called Mama's Baby, Papa's Baby. Mm -hmm. And so it's like, you know, like I said, we could, we, not, and you know, Sadia Hartman went to, when she was a young child, went to Black Panther camp, I mean, like Black Power camps. So we, we couldn't be here without the people and who, who did the work against the state. And uh, I couldn't do what I do without Hartman. <coughs> Stories, but the point to get directly to your to finish your question is that she makes this point and she says, feminist, uh, I'm, I'm paraphrasing and I'm putting in my own words, but I'm hopefully I'm making it simple without making it simplistic. <coughs> She's basically saying that feminist theory assumes consent as a constituent element of the position. And she's saying that for black women, Consent is never on the table, so that so that the the, the world doesn't if, if the world doesn't reckon, you can't say I have you violating my consent. That's not valid. The, the only thing if your statements about yourself are only valid if the structure around you 
puts it back to you. you know? And that's true even in war. You know, in other words, they, they bombed the hell out of Iraq, but they recognized its sovereignty even as it's being bombed. And the, one of the things about this contribution is that at every le level of abstraction, and now she's dealing with the body and the, and, and the black female body in particular, at every level of abstraction, blackness cannot get the other to recognize it as sovereign. And if you're not recognized as sovereign, then you then you have not been violated. And so she moves through these elaborate uh, uh, and, and, uh, and analysis of, of 19th century uh, uh, slave women who have been raped and, and have retaliated against their master or tried to take it to, to court to, to show how the problem was the problem of the position that was assumed, which could not be reciprocated in its assumption. A woman did not come to court. A slave came to court. Now, the, the, the hydraulics of violence in the academy, and I'm saying this, she didn't say this, but I, I was a student, so I'm saying it. <laughs> the hydraulics of violence in the academy is that a little black woman in an English department could not write that with a bunch of white feminists around her as a scenario of the 20th century. She had to camouflage it as an allegory of the past. But if you, you, you <laughs> but uh, uh, we, we had, uh, it was a 2002 interview that I did of her um, in a key part. Some of us know that, you know, they know that they're, and, and in this interview, um, she says, I want this book to be read as an allegory of the present. And this is, so in other words, what I'm trying to say is that, is that even a black professor is subjugated to the constraints of slavery. Because the question is, as Baldwin has said, how much of what I'm dealing with can these people deal with? Mm. And let me figure out how much they can deal with and write that much yeah. and nothing more. <laughs> <laughs> what was the second? I think I have some other. Can I go to the next question? Still, I'm trying to understand um, why anti-blackness is not a form of reinforcement for capitalists. Why you think in its way of being psychic, repetitive, fantasy-like, it's something more? And then my second question, this is towards my students in the room who are scholar activists in Africana studies and are dealing with a, a myriad of issues at the Claremont Colleges is, how, how would you think your work could inform their activism? Well, thank uh, you. <laughs> so we're going to talk about those heavy things. <laughs> um, so I, you know, it's many people. I, I know you know this because we go you go back to the days. The, well, I should say the word you reminded the word after pessimism actually comes from this 2002 interview with Hartman. It's not a word that Jared Simpson and I uh, came up with. It's, it's a word that Cynthia Hartman uh, came up with. Um, but I don't think it, it's. See, I don't, I don't believe that that, that I have a, a capitalist electric that's separate oceans, oceans apart. Um, what I do, I, I'll, I'll try to make it as concise as, as possible, is um, getting back to that person in, in Soweto, you know, we need theory. And what he meant was we need theory about how to undo the world, not theory about how to live in the world. Okay, so that's what I'm trying to contribute to. And in those particular days, one believed that if one destroyed relations of, of, of economic relations, destroyed capitalism, there would be a, there would be a new world. And I think that that for me, um, that would be a, a good start. But on the other hand, I think that the theorization, the re revolutionary theory, is far too lopsided in in the in the rational discourse of. Of Marxism. So I'm not trying to throw it out. What I'm saying is that we need a theory of the unconscious, the legitimate economy, that because I think an institution is, whether it's the family or college or the police department, is as, is as fundamentally a product of libidinal economy as it is a product of political economy. And 90% of the political work that you read is thinking institutional structures through political economy. And I really think that, that um, so that's, 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 that's one thing. And I think that, that, I think that anti blackness is um, the bedrock of 
the limb economy that, that is subtended by structural violence to make the world. I, I, I fundamentally believe that if we were to get rid of capitalism throughout the world, there would still be anti-blackness as, as a fundamental orienting and organizing principle of institutions. And in the first 10 pages of, of uh, Orlando Patterson's Slavery and Social Death, one of the points that he, that he makes is a, is a point that I, that I uh, just answered before with about an ocean of violence needed to, to create a, a new paradigm. And he makes, this, he makes this really, he doesn't linger enough on it, what the book is about that, but what he's saying is that, look, there's a way in which an ocean of violence produces the two, two <coughs> positions in a paradigm that did not exist before. One is worker and one is boss. This, these positions did not exist before, and the paradigm of capitalism did not exist before, and the ocean of violence that, that was necessary was, was overwhelming. Then he says, once the paradigm is in place, and once people are, are calling themselves workers and bosses, and that's not an issue anymore, the way people call themselves men and women, then, and when, and when the paradigm is saturated with growth, then the violence that is needed to, to, to create that paradigm goes into remission. And it rears its head when it is necessary to maintain the integrity of the relations. People are strike and there's a revolution in Cuba or that kind of thing. Okay, so the violence, the violence is irrational and and you know like a brush fire to get it to get it started. But when the structure is in place, the the, the violence goes into remission. This is a, this is one of the, the, the organizing principles of Gramsci's prison notebooks. But he says for slavery, and this is where he's saying the historians are wrong. He said for slavery. The violence is pre-logical, just as it was to set up capitalism, but it stays pre-logical once the slave, once the position has been uh, acknowledged and once the paradigm is, is set up. And I, and I believe that, um, that, what that, what, what that what that means is that this violence then has another, as I said, my talk, another utility than the utility of violence that is found in most theories of political economy. That utility has to do with the nature of what does it mean to be, who am I? And that's what I think, that's what I think in, in, in a nutshell, the um, anti-black violence is. It, it doesn't produce land, it doesn't, at the essential level, the, most blacks are working class, so these are all working together, but if you're going to undo the world, you have to ask yourself, what is the paradigm for if it were to be undone we would be on the cusp of an epistemological break. The world would not exist anymore. And I fundamentally believe it's, it's, it's the social death of, 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 of black people because at the end of the day, um, the utility of anti-black violence is not for profits, it's not for land, it's for the psychic health of the rest of the world. While you're on the notion of anti-black black violence, in the podcast you talk about the moments in Ferguson when you hear people talk about it during protests on Human Two, yeah. would you elaborate on that? Well, I, I think I think I think that uh, as I was saying to, to Avery, um, the mind is a is a dissonant thing, <laughs> and and one of the one of the things I mean, okay, I can understand what I just said, but I can't live it. You know what I'm saying? I got a daughter and a granddaughter, right? I don't say, well, you know, did you read my book on social death? And by the way, you no. Know. Um, so, so this is what I mean by, by uh, revolutionary movements. The, 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 the theorists should be able to theorize beyond what the political project can address. That's okay. That's okay. We should be able to live with questions that we cannot resolve. Um, and because if we don't, and, I, and, I, and, I, and it's the we and I mean specifically here is black people. What happens is that we, we have this period of time between the age of like 20 and 66, 67, when we fill our, we fill our headspace with compensatory gestures of provisional humanity, which we masquerade as real humanity. And then, we, then all that goes away, and we're retired, we're just out there, and it's like, holy shit, okay, I'm black again. You know, uh, so this is so what, what I what I think is happening. This is this is not a criticism of those people. It was a 
it was a, um, a, an elaboration of a symptom. It's like everybody wants to be recognized. Everybody wants to be incorporated. And it's traumatizing to, uh, it was, you know, as, as Pernod theorized, to think through a, a theory that everyone's humanity depends on my objection. At the, at the end of the day, can you, because there, there has to be a semiotics of violence, there has to be a semiotics of presence. No one can say, if, 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 if you were to say um, the word cat actually has no intrinsic meaning, the only way that meaning is developed by that word cat is because what is adjacent to it? Tigers and lions, and what is opposed to it? Dogs, okay? So there has to be, uh, there has to be a grammar of difference which you don't have to intellectually understand, but you carry around with you to actually give your psychic um, ideas some kind of, of validity. And I think that blackness functions as the foil against which everyone else can understand themselves as being human. That's number one. But we are also sentient beings, so we want to be part of something, right? I mean, that's, that's I would say that 90% of the people who who ratted out slave revolts weren't doing it because they were down with the masters. They just see, here's life over here, and here's death over here, and maybe if I go along to get along in some kind of way, I'll have some kind of access to it. They didn't understand it's not performative, it's structural. It's a, it's a necessary objection. It's not, you can't like strategize yourself out of that. Now, but the mind, not every, not every psychic register of the mind can accept that, you know? Um, you know, my father says, <laughs> he's a psychologist, you know? he, 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 I'm a, I'm a propagandist, turn theorist, poet and creative writer. He's a theoretician and a, a, he knows philosophy and math, you know, so you can read that and that's what they're He said, hey, I'm not gonna this loopy Alice in Wonderland logic of yours, you know? I have no other choice but go to Washington, in Minneapolis, you know? go to Washington, D.C. and kill every white person in sight. <laughs> So hyperbolic. How is that hyperbolic? You wouldn't have to go all the way to Washington. <laughs> 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 so, you know, because it, it was an act of bad faith because he was so uncomfortable yeah. with the analysis, you know, that he that he ratcheted the level of abstraction down from a structural analysis of a paradigm to a personal intervention of what am I gonna do with this? Yeah. I don't know what you're gonna do with this, you know? Is, 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 that, is that the litmus test of theory? I gotta know what I'm gonna do with this, you know? I have no idea, I can't, you know? Uh, but, I don't, but I know that I didn't create it. It'd be like saying it's raining outside and you ask me why did I do that? You know? <laughs> this is a report. And so um, I think that um, there's a yearning to be part of the human community. There's also a deep, grammatical, let's say intuitive for some, theoretical for others, understanding that the human community needs the black as its foil for its own coherence. coherence. Now, what that means in terms of, uh, in terms of struggle, and this gets back to the second part of your, your question, uh, is, is that um, typically, as, uh, as uh, my friend and colleague and comrade Jerry Sexton says, you know, black people get in these multicultural coalitions and they end up being refugees. So they're refugees in everybody else's political project. What did he mean by that? Uh, he meant that um, the, this, this grammar of social death that my father is being irritated by pushing back at, refusing to, convert, refusing to, argue, to argue at the level of abstraction that I argue. What he's saying is this is too painful. I can't go anymore with you on this. You know? so, it's, so I'm gonna have a moment of aggressivity. I'm gonna fall at you whatever I want. You know? <laughs> and, uh, but uh, I think that what happens in movements, and this is the one thing that could be worked on, that I know of, you know is that uh, people tend to not create the space for black suffering to be articulated unless that suffering can show some form of relationship to the suffering of others, which is the thing. All others are thinking about is 
which is legitimate, is a radical program of access to civil society. What we're dealing with is the fact that civil society is our murderer. So we can't have access to it because if we go back to that one little temple of Toro College, it is predicated on our sexual mutilation and our death. You know, that's what it means to have a place. And so, um, but, the, but what happens in the political, in the multicultural political coalition is what Jared Sexton calls, it gets over, it gets imbued with what he calls the, the anxiety antagonism. To say the anxiety of what does it mean to let the people in the room who have a problem that has no theoretical means of redress, what does it mean to let that problem flower? You know? And um, and when I say it's legitimate, well, you know, I was I was doing uh, solidarity work in the set on the first time of the uh, with a Palestinian friend of mine uh, in, in Minneapolis, and one of the things he said to me, his his his, his cousin, his first cousin had died the, the day before uh, in Ramallah. Uh, by, uh, they made him, he, he was making a bomb in Ramallah, and the bomb blew up, and, 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 and he died. So I'm consoling my friend, and there's this moment in which uh, he's completely unguarded, you know, because that's how close they were. And he says to me, this is what I mean by legitimate economy, he says, you know, we're talking about the life of Ramallah and the check and everything, and he says, um, it's really horrible the way uh, they, they frisk you and pat you down uh, and, and abuse your body at, 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 the, che at the checkpoints, and especially how they, they, in these cases, I'm going to they do our women, right? He says, but the, the, the worst thing is to, be, is to be patted down by the Ethiopian Jew. And I looked over and I realized that, that he hadn't actually heard what he said, you know, <laughs> I thought, oh, okay, here's the arms trade, you know, and we're going to kind of manifest in itself, you know, and, and so what, what, I'm, what, I'm, what I'm suggesting is that, and in the car up here we talked about, you know, the four weeks I spent in Cuba and how these, at a particular point in time, these uh, black, uh, there's a group of people in San Francisco called Global Exchange, and how these black Cubans said, we want to talk to the black Americans alone. And the Cubans were like, what? You know how to listen to me? You know, and, and so what we found in that we had this conversation and we found that you know the, the micro and macro aggressions of anti-blackness that they were experiencing were, were at the performative level, they weren't the, the murderous stuff that we're getting here, but it was such that it gave lie to the sense that the communist revolution had laid waste to all this. And um, I went to like you find uh, Nahada uh, from the Black Liberation Army, and, and she and I were having coffee down there, and and she said, you know, I don't know what's going to happen when these black people wake up here. But the thing is that the Cubans were so resistant, uh, the white Cubans who had who to this idea, they accused, you know, and, and Jared Sexton says, you can set your watch by this, you know, um, first it's guilt, uh, <coughs> then resentment. Then aggressivity, you know, that's all the movements at first, you know, kill go, you know, then we, res we resent you black Americans for starting shit down there. We didn't ask to have this conversation, okay? <laughs> you know, black people, you know, and then aggressivity, you know, you're against the Cuban state, you're against, no, 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 no. I think Cuba is the best thing that happened to the Western Hemisphere. But it's also an anti-black state by necessity, by necessity. I think I saw another hand, sorry. When you're talking about the need of humans to identify and feel part of the group, you said, I think something along the lines of that 90% of those went along with slavery, I think you said, did it because they saw, oh, okay, here's a way of living, and here's a way of, here's death, and I want to identify with. Could you like no, I, 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 I spoke too fast and I spoke my words. Okay. <laughs> what, what, I, what I meant was that um, there, there, are, there are moments of, of uh, in-group, someone in a group betraying, like there's going to be a slavery moment, people are going to leave. You know? and, and I'm trying to think the, 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 the psychology of that person. You know? And, I'm, and I'm, I'm thinking that, that it's, it, it has a lot to do with wanting to be part of a community as opposed to uh, being politically against one's own. That's all. That was. That's all I was saying. You know, why would a person? Why would someone do that? You know? Why? Yeah. 
uh, betray a secret meeting about a slave revolt. Yeah. Um, and um, and I also I, I also think that what you know getting back to um, you know the, the question about political organizing, um, I think we understand uh, as I, I, you know, I certainly understand I do a lot of political organizing in the Bay, you know the costs of bringing up anti-blackness in a multicultural coalition that says we all suffer the same thing the same way. In other words, a multicultural coalition that is not willing to um, use the space of its activism to allow for the thinking about the difference between white supremacy and anti-blackness. Um, and I think that a lot of black people just don't want to push against that, number one, and also want to be part of the group. And the group exploits that. They exploit black energy for the verb of the group. Uh, they exploit black rage. But as soon as they get this, what they what they got, what they needed, uh, they become this, you know, uh, kind of the same problem. And um, in that period, I went to a, a conference in UC, in UC Santa Cruz. Um, can I take this in just two minutes? But at the end of the conference, uh, it was on race, you know, racial oppression. At the end of the conference, uh, the organizer said, you want everyone to break away into rooms to deal with your color and the way the police um, aggress against your, your relationship to police violence based upon your, 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 your <coughs> color as opposed to your cultural identity. And the room, something really interesting happened. This has to do, this is why I think a study for non-black skin black mass is as important as studying uh, Russia of the Earth, or at least reading till the end of, you know, studying psychoanalysis and liberal economy is as important as studying political economy because the affect in the room split at that particular moment. What I mean by the affect, I mean this, this emotional charge that, uh, this, that, is, that is group oriented but can't necessarily be pinned down to, to language. By that I mean the blacks were out the door. Like, yes, <laughs> now we get to talk about blackness and policing. The other people were yelling at the people on stage, I'm not yellow. I'm not red, I'm not brown, you know. And I, you know, and you can't say there are different forms of Asians, different forms of Latinos, you know, they were they were not willing to surrender to the, a positional exercise based on melanin. They wanted to maintain the integrity of their cultural identity. And the organizers were very polite, well the police don't actually ask you. <laughs> you know, they just shoot your ass based upon your color, you know. And so, uh, what, what, what we, what? So there was this major, major argument happening, and and the and the black people were getting angry because we wanted to go have this talk, right, on the pigs and our color, you know. And the room didn't want that. We all been together grooving for like two days, right? And so, it, but then another interesting thing happened. People who had, uh, who were bi called this a biracial, also came up. Because the organizers were telling everybody, you don't get to do this. Th it, this is the exercise, go deal with it, come back in 90 minutes and, and report back to Hunter. So what happened was that the way they got their way was that the people who were biracial came up and said, we're not just black, we're not black, we're, we're not black, you know, we're, we're, we're both. And, but what was interesting is that their performance was hyperbolically black. Mm. So they got, you know, they got book, right? <laughs> like they're gonna set it off, okay, while articulating their uh, their vibrationalism. So they, and, and so and that made you like, whoa, you know, it's, it's like black rage in the service of, of not wanting to be part of a black group. So we were like, fuck this, you know, we went to our room and did our thing, right? And, and the first thing we did when we got to that room was we tore up the sheet of paper that, that asked the question, how do you come back to your allies of color and get them, because we're not having that conversation, mm. okay? And, uh, and, and what was really interesting to me is the way in which, you know, the, um, in the psychoanalysis, the truth was that there is no time in the unconscious. And when there were no other people in the room that anyone had to relate to, people were talking about stuff on their job, like at the university or at a factory, in the terms of slavery. 
as though it just happened yesterday. I mean, and no one said, wait, wait a minute, this is like historically, you know, and, and, and it was cathartic, people were crying and stuff like that. We just, we, we, for 90 minutes, hour into the thing, there was this kind of knock at the door. You open the door, and it's the biracial people. <laughs> and they're like, and so most people are like, yeah, what do y'all want? <laughs> you know? And uh, they're like, uh, uh, could, could we join? <laughs> you know? and, and, you know, I, I credit myself for having uh, read uh, Jared Sexton and been in class with him at UC um, Berkeley, where we were all together, having read his dissertation, which later became a book called Amalgamation Schemes, you know, because I was pissed off too, but I had read that book. You know, which was a as a as a biracial person, he doesn't want to be identified with like that. He's like black. It's a critique of all the discourses of biracialism as being essentially anti-black discourses. It's a very brilliant book. And I had read that book in manuscript form, and, and I said to them, "I never <coughs> left this room." Aww. You know, you can, of course you can tell me because you never left. You thought you were, but you you actually never left. You know. And that was a really important moment. So if that group had said, OK, we're going to put ourselves in the position of our color, the way blacks are always in that position, we're going to forgo the need to talk about our cultural identity, our language, what food means. We're going to just do, we're going to do the exercise like they said, how do the pigs see you? And come back in 90 minutes. That would have been a kind of olive branch to the black people in the room. But what they said is, we want the specificity of our identity, which is something you can't claim. Mm -hmm. uh, one here, then here. Uh, thank you so much uh, for the talk here today and for all the work. Um, I, had, I had a question, a couple questions. So um, you, you talk about in the, in the interview uh, with Dr. Hayden um, about these, these three moments of uh, recognition of irreconcilability. Right, so uh, Turner, Tubman, uh, the Black Liberation Army, we talked about students going with, talk about MOVE. There was this kind of moments where people reach a point where they understand and are moved to a place where they have to shift. Um, and yet the response from the state is um, uh, so gratuitous, the suffering so, so, so incredible, um, that it renders the next movements uh, more fearful, less likely to happen. So I'm wondering then, do you foresee, where are we in, have we seen any sort of shifts like that towards irreconcilable? Are we in that moment now, or, or um, and then what, what, what should we do about it? And the other question is kind of tied to that one too. Um, it, you, you say there's no good reason to get out of bed. <laughs> As a black person. Jared okay, <laughs> signing Jared Sexton. Um, is fugitivity, is that a potential space uh, of imagination? Uh, of, or even if not fugitivity, because that's still tied to the creation of the world, um, something beyond despair, like uh, other folks have critiqued Afro-pessimism around uh, ideas that there's more to black than this, right? There's abundance. Um, or even pre, the pre-war, 500 years before uh, all this mess. Is there anything for us there, you know, as, as someone who's, who's attempting to, to do work with folks? Well, the last part of your question, yes, I, as I said, you know, my emphasis is on structure. So yes, there's more, and, it, and I would refer you to uh, an article that Jared Sexton wrote in, in um, Dialogue, Debate, whatever you want to call it, with, with Fred Moten, uh, called The Social Life of Social Death, okay? So yes, of course. On the other hand, um, I'm 61 years old. My, what I want to do is emphasize the structural dynamic. In other words, let's say you're a writer of Marxist theory. You could, you could it would be really worthwhile to write an archive of books about the difference in the labor conditions of people working in sweatshops compared to the labor conditions of people working, say, in, in a Swedish factory. That would be a very valid book, right? And, and it would contribute to the labor movement. It would contribute to the revolutionary, a revolutionary Marxist movement. But there's also another kind of book, which is to show how the structure of subjugation is the same, how the commodity formation and relations of capital, even though the experience of capital is very different from a sweatshop worker to someone working with all kinds of social and, and labor rights in, in Sweden, it's different. How the structure of capital is the same all over, and that's and that's a 
And, and I think that in the American Academy, in particular, there's so much emphasis on hope, and there's so much emphasis on, on what you can do, that you don't get taught uh, that, that what, 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 ha what actually happens is that um, violence as a tactic becomes denigrated. And so, um, and we need to get, we need to get, we need to become more comfortable. We need to understand that nothing is going to change without uh, a countervailing force and, and the deepness of it. Because if you, if you were to actually read the first set of books that I said as a Marxist, then you would consider uh, the, the zenith of struggle as the expansion of labor rights, as opposed to the destruction of a capitalist world. And you know, this is just not, that's not the kind of, that's not the quality of thinking that I want to infuse students with. It's not what, you know, it's what my parents wanted, right? But it's not what the Panthers wanted. <laughs> and so, <laughs> and so I, it, that, so, so it's, it's, it's about, Yes, there's abundance, and yes, there's more to it. But what Cynthia Hartman also makes clear in that book, and, I, and there's, there's, this is, I think this is an exciting moment in black studies because this is a fault line, right? Um, I write poetry, I write fiction, I write creative nonfiction. I'm involved in an aesthetic, okay? So I would bring my aesthetic to liberation, but I also bring my gun. Mm. They're both necessary. And I think that there's just not enough talk about, there's not enough e emphasis on the violence of subjugation. There's too, there's too much emphasis on the on possibility. And ultimately what that does for someone like me as a professor is it makes me, uh, when I encounter students in revolt, right, it makes me intuitively an anger management type person mm -hmm. as opposed to someone who can learn from that, you know? Uh, and I, I was really shocked when I came back from South Africa. I was teaching in Compton, and uh, you know, the kids, it was the eighth grade, and I was telling them, oh, Tom, you gotta act right, you know, you not, you know, you gotta get your education going, you know? And, and, and uh, you know, one kid, he just looked at his shirt up like that, but, huh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> he had to die right there, you know? <laughs> you know? And, so, and so I said, okay, let's have a conversation about this, you know? What is it, you know, and I told them about going to Dr. Kaj 74 and how someone said, you know, we don't think black students should do economics, should at least black in the front row, leave, please, you know. And I was doing, I, against my better judgment, you know, but probably just deep in my psyche, I was doing this bougie, bootstrap, upper mobility, respectability politics with them, you know. And one person said to me, so did you cap his ex? And I said, well, what do you mean? I was in college, what do you know? And, and he said, I, I said, I didn't have a gun. He said, well, who do you think you are going to go into a white place without a gun, you know? And now, you know, I'm not saying what to do with that information. <laughs> You're being recorded. <laughs> but what I am saying is that the typical person in my position would not have taken that as a point of wisdom. You know, yeah. you know, it would have said, "Oh, I need to tell this person how to behave better." You know, and I knew that a hundred thousand jobs over five years had, had left Compton. You know, and that was repeated to happen. You know, I knew all this stuff, and I was at Tardis Wado, and I'd seen the conditions in Compton how were worse than the things places where I taught in in, in Soledo. and the policing was heavier here. Mm -hmm. you, know, you know, and still I'm coming with these respectability politics bullshit, right? And so he says, so the class says to me, what are you actually saying to us? Are you saying that if we just sit here and listen to what you're saying and do right, that all of us can get out of here? Mm. Or one or two of us? Mm. <laughs> I was like, oh. okay. <laughs> well, <laughs> you know, so, so, um, so yes, I, 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 as, as, as there are various registers of, of, this, of the psyche and subjectivity, I concentrate on one, which is, you know, with dabbling into societal analysis. But I'm distrustful of the preconscious. I'm distrustful of the of the of the enunciation of what people say about themselves. And I also think that um, the I there's there's too much baggage for me attached to the theorization of of, of joy and future. Not that it's wrong. I'm talking about the the the, the emotional baggage that's actually 
Because what it doesn't allow for is the joy of destruction. The, you know, and it's, and it's constantly, um, Sexton had a grad student who was doing a work in the schools in San Francisco, and she brought a group of kids at the table, you know, Samoans, uh, Asian, Latinos, uh, you know, black, and she said, tell me about what's happening here. You know, they had all their horror stories. It's heavily policed, and what are the five things that we, that we need to change? And the ugly group had five things, right? She said, oh, thank you very much, you know, she wrote it. And, and then the black kid said, we got five more. And she said, oh, okay. Three, five. And then she said, no, we got five more. So <laughs> she said, no, we got five more. And you know, it was like the, 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 the antagonism is a bottomless pit. It's, 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 a, it's a response to a kind of subjugation which, as if we go back to the analysis of the Electoral College, actually doesn't have language that can be attached to it. It's, it's, beyond, it's beyond the words that are used to describe the suffering of other people. And if the coalition isn't ready for that, they're not ready for black people in it. The first thing I was thinking about is um, conceptions of the human, which offers some room for like the rehabilitation of that concept, like Sylvia Winter thinking, if you know, we can de uh, disentangle our contemporary notion of man from what the human is, then there might be room there for some kind of recuperative work. But um, if I like understand the pessimism part of Afro pessimism. Um, there doesn't seem to be much rehabilitative space here, and I was wondering if the abolition of humanity as such is like a, a, a part of the violence that's being a, advocated for here. And then um, I just like to look for no, um, I'm just explaining. I'm not advocating because other I had to be like witnesses in my sedition trial. So <laughs> <laughs> I feel like I always have to make this comment, but you know, it, it's okay that you said that, but I gotta just put this yeah. on record. <laughs> All I do is explain, you know? <laughs> okay, part of the um, project that is here under discussion. Yes, indeed, there you go. <laughs> and then secondly, thinking about social death, I think um, in my understanding of social death, I like, it, it reads to me as like, a moment before which there is life and then there is the like event of a death but the notion of being like stillborn always already dead born into a society where you were never alive in the first place mm -hmm. I, I don't really have a question attached to that but I was wondering if you could speak on that that's very bit. important well so so what you the last point is is a very complicated point it's, it's precisely where someone like myself or Sexton or David Marriott or Cindy Hartman actually are partying with uh, Orlando Patterson, but, but building on his work. And there are many points where I partner with Fanon and build on his work. Um, and, um, and, I, and I think there's, a, there's some slight, I think, I think I couldn't do this work without Winter's work. But the rehabilitative part is not you know, there for me. Now, this is the conundrum, the last thing that, that, that you said, because what, what pa Patterson is saying is that here is social death. Here are the constituent elements of it. NATO alienation, in other words, you may say you have a grandmother, a grandfather, a, a child, but the world doesn't recognize your affiliation. That was my, my poem, right? So that's one component. The other is general dishonor. You may say, I can act honorably, or I can act dishonorably, but your slave status always marks you by others as a prior dishonor. And the third thing is gratuitous violence. And this is where he says that, that the violence against the slave actually is pre-logical. You, you can't say, oh, here's what it means, here's what it does for the structure. And this is, this is the symptomatic problem in slave narratives, such as 12 Years a Slave. You know? um, so those are the three elements. Now, you're absolutely right. Patterson then goes on to say, these are the elements that you, that, that, um, make you socially dead how in, regardless of how you've been recruited into social death. And this is the, and so he actually has a narrative arc prior to social death, recruitment, <coughs> social death, and then he problematizes in a very complicated argument the problem of manumission, which we won't, which we won't go into. Where we have parted with that is, is that 
and this is, uh, as, I, as I've said before, this is the, what I think to be a very exciting issue of debate in black studies, and I think that black studies is the bedrock of humanities, mm -hmm. because through black studies, one thinks not the performance of subjectivity, but subjectivity itself, right? And the, the, the thing is that, that we're, what we're suggesting is that recruitment is not the modality in blackness. In other words, uh, and I'm not an expert on this, I, I do know some grad students who are, who are working on this moment that S.C. E. Anderson talks about in his graphic comic book called The Black Holocaust for Beginners, this, this moment of 625 AD, where the Arabs make a decision. It's, a, it's, it's not a volition, it's kind of a, a communal consensus that Africa is the place of slaves. That's very interesting, because at this moment, this consensus from 625 AD gets picked up by the Chinese, by Moroccan Jews, by East Indians. It becomes a global consensus. And this is the, this, and then we have two words coming into the lexicon that weren't there before. One is black and the other is Africa. And so blackness is elaborated through this consensus that this is a continental prison through which we pick up socially dead mm. beings. Mm. There is no moment of recruitment. That to me is fascinating and horrifying. Mm. In other words, that, that you cannot separate this blackness from the social, from social death. And these are people who before this happened, they, they were not black. They were Buganda, Maasai, uh, which they maintain, you know, just like I'm from New Orleans, right? But you don't, position yourself, right? The paradigm exceeds and anticipates you. And what's interesting to me is that the, the libidinal economy of the globe begins this consensus without this kind of thing of war, aggression, it's just this kind of consensus that social death is the, the Africa is the place of social death. And it's there in Arab poetry. It's there in the literature. It's it's um, uh, it's there in Mauritania today, where the Bedanes, right, <coughs> meaning whites, are the masters of conservative estimate. Two hundred fifty thousand chattel slaves. I don't mean slavery in the way that I'm talking about in the U.S. I mean real people in chains, right? Or um, if you uh, um, Cotton wrote a book uh, in which he marks it at five hundred thousand. And black, and it's, and even though the Baydanes would come here and be marked as black, in the libidinal economy, they make the division between slavery and freedom through their sense of their whiteness versus the uh, southern uh, Mauritanian's uh, blackness. And they, they have this thing where they say, this is where, again, where I say that a, 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 group, uh, a communal unconscious is very important. Because the, 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 the a Mauritanian official will tell you, We've abolished slavery three times. <laughs> they, and they have. <laughs> the last time was a constitutional declaration in 1980. There are still, in conservative estimates, 250,000 black chattel slaves. They, then they will say, no, if you actually convert to Islam, you're no longer a slave. Most of those slaves are Islamic, or Muslim. So um, it's, it's, I don't, I, what I think is, is interesting and paradigmatically important is that blackness and slaveness are, in, are, are elaborated and implicated uh, together, and this is a kind of psychic lens which then the Arabs pass on to the Portuguese, mm -hmm. and it becomes the organizing principle for life itself. Mm -hmm. Hi. Hi. Um, I went here, uh, I was a dance major here. You were upset? I went here and I was a dance major here. Oh, okay. Um, that's, if I don't say that, then I'm not alive. Um, I've, I found it interesting having had some time in the econ and finance world, having managing directors that were very powerful white women, and then being a student and being in the dance world and seeing a lot of the leadership and a lot of the grants and a lot of opportunities given to powerful white women. And then <laughs> now working here as full-time staff, it's really clear that there is like a legion of like really incredible white women who like spearhead education and then I think back to when I was a, a young child and a lot of my teachers they were also white women and so I've had this like 
consistent presence of like white women in power in my life. And I feel like as soon as I got to college, there was like this really sharp difficulty in conveying those, that like narrative for myself. Um, and the way you approached the topic today of trying to like read parallel gender as as structural and I guess like divisive as race is, um, it was really impactful. And I guess for the, you know, like I'm working right now. And so I went upstairs to like go do an event. And the first person who asked me like, how was the talk was a white woman in an elevator. And I'm just like, so, <laughs> you know, so <laughs> I just wanted like a really, you know, like a simple way to begin to dive into these things that doesn't, you, you know, I know, yeah, yeah, I, I, yeah, that doesn't, that doesn't one like, you know, ignite me where I'm like, woo, for the top, here we go, or already, you know, like shuts them down, so they're like. Oh my god, I can't believe, you know, like, I always feel like I'm caught in the middle of, like, you, you know, like, educating slash, like, wilding out. Yeah. Well, I, I, I yes, yeah, so, so I'm going to, I'm going to address your question without answering it, because, I, because, you know, you, you have to ask, this, this is why. Um, one of the things I cannot do, because I'm a, messed up as anybody in this room, <laughs> is say, how do you live, how do you live through this? I find it, you know, as, as I was saying to, to uh, uh, Nicole Maria in, in the car, you know, I, 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 like, like some people have a lost weekend, you know, right? I have like a lo lost eight years, my work as a stockbroker, okay? And um, one of the things that, um, that I believe fundamentally is that something better is that is my life isn't I make less money now, but being able to explain the problem does something for me. I don't know what it does, but it does something there. The, the eight years that I worked there, I just had to shut up and I got dumber and dumber and dumber and I couldn't explain my own subjugation, right? Nor can I go after work to, to the to the Mozambique support network that I worked for without people you know questioning my loyalties and all that. So um, I don't, if you read my memoir, Incom Negro, uh, you'll see just how messed up I am, okay? So I, what I tried to do is pour gasoline on myself and light a match in, in order to give voice to the things that we don't often, often talk about. And the, the narr part of the narrative deals with my um, white partner, wife, and my uh, black African partner, wife, sh showing how this, these problems erupt, right? And so in publishing, white women are very prominent at the letter, le level of editor, not at the level of publisher. Okay, the difference, we're born at the level of editor. And uh, one of the things that they had extreme difficulty uh, with this book, I, I'm, supposed, I'm not supposed to say the press, because uh, you might want to go back to that. <laughs> but they had extreme difficulty with this, with this book because there's this, there's this, this assumption or let me say a, an unwillingness to think force, which is the force of an individual uh, muscle pleasure, uh, violence, separately and with power, which is, as Sexton says, what institutional forces can you marshal? You know? So the actual, and part of it was, was dealing with, with um, white dance professor and <laughs> you should mention that <laughs> and, uh, and and white women in the English department who were uh, oppressing a black professor and you'll have to read the book it's, it takes place in, in, in Santa Cruz and the white women who were editing this were getting really anxious and I thought I was being strategic because I sent them all the South Africa chapters first they're like this is edgy <laughs> he's such a great writer I mean I, I went there one day and they were all it's, a, it's the great Frank Wilderson and I said Mm -hmm. And so my editor was an East Indian woman. I said, things are probably, there's going to be a sea shift when we get the California chapters. <laughs> you know? And there was, right? And so they actually came at me with, this is an anti-feminist um, critique. And we don't, we don't get this. You know? I said, okay, so 
what would what would we do to make it palatable for you, right? They said, change the names of the women. I said, well, it's a, it's, you could do that in a memoir, but it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a memoir, so, you know. And so I said, oh, can I, give me the names of the women you want to change. They said, listen, and I, I had a meeting with them, and I said, you know what's interesting about this? Uh, if you see this list, it's all the white women who worked. Did you know that? <laughs> you didn't want my mother's name changed. You didn't want my first wife's name changed. You didn't want any of the black women's names changed. You know, which is, and this was not, there was nothing calculated about it. It was simply the unconscious mobilizing itself into the preconscious, and it showed exactly where their carrying energy was, and exactly what they meant by, uh, uh, you know, by by feminism. And so. Um, I just think it's, I'm, I'm just commiserating with you. It's, 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 <laughs> yeah, like, yeah, Does that help? I'm what I think, what I, what I think is that the answer is, is coming, but it, will, it really can't come from the, I mean, the answer in terms of how you struggle. I have something to say about this, I've been in struggles. But I don't think I should be the one to actually, because I think black youth, are typically the people that are most capable because, to give you a little example, which I probably not, the, the, the BSU at, at UC Irvine is really, really loud. They've got 10 demands. You know, one is to, to get rid of the multicultural uh, curriculum. They have a structural analysis course, you know, uh, or anti of power. The other is to the complete abolishment of, of the police. Um, um, <laughs> Uh, and so I was sitting in, in the office, and I'm the advisor to the BSU. So I was sitting in, in the conference room where they were uh, supposed to meet with the chancellor. And at one point, they went, you know, he was just saying, I'm going to set up an advisory committee. I'll decide who's on it. Uh, we're not going to, you're not going to have the participation that you want. He said, you know, he said it, was, it, was, it was like no um, the, the development of power whatsoever, you know. So they started to go off, right? I can't actually, you know, I swear, but I can't actually say all the words because like different combinations of motherfucking <laughs> <laughs> heard for the first time, right? You know? And so, <laughs> you know, and it was that moment that I was like, just uh, that moment over here about, you know, where he turns to me, you know, and his face like, are you, are you gonna, you know, are you gonna, are you gonna deal with this, you know? And what was, yeah, so, so, I mean, um, for the historical record, I did the right thing, right? <laughs> but what I found was my body chemistry was so anxious. I mean, I was, I was sweating, you know? <laughs> you, know, you know? And that's the thing with Bernard says, you know, um, something happens to the native when he, he sees the settler bleed, and this changes the world in a very necessary manner. Okay, you are making him bleed, okay? But now I was the palm, right? Okay, and so I'm like, Holy shit. <laughs> you, you're a full professor. He can't fire you for not disciplining him. Can't you understand that? You know, it's just like, you know, I'm, still, I'm just anxious, right? Well, why am I anxious? Because, you know, 20 years in the academy, my whole psychic makeup has actually changed in ways that I'm not aware of, you know? And so I can't possibly be the person to, to actually articulate to them what, it, what, the, what the practice of setting it off would be because whether I know it or not, I'm going to come with moderation. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to come with some type of institutional loyalty that, embar that will embarrass me later on, mm -hmm. but which is in my body. Once again, we, we truly appreciate and thank you for bringing what I consider to be good medicine, okay? Because part of what the I think the response is to Joe Reynolds' question is, is that we often see the, see this see ourselves trying to um, live in the world, and we turn whatever happens on ourselves. And the one thing I think, Joe, I would say to you is at least you know you're not crazy. <laughs> and that's that's the usefulness as you calculate and construct what actions you have to do. Thank you all for being here.